All right, there we go. Hey, what's up, everyone? How we doing? My name is Nick Kleitch, and uh, for those who know what this playlist is all about and are ready to continue reading the book of the month, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, go ahead and fast forward to about the 130 marker and we will dive in. For those who don't know me, what's up? Welcome. Like I said, my name is Nick Kleitch. I am the creator of the Life with Nick YouTube channel and the host of the Life with Nick podcast. Um, from here, if you're new to the channel, welcome to you. Uh, a quick outline on my channel is this for y'all. Uh, first off, I read a book a month and read it and discuss it with you. Uh, these books are generally under the umbrella of personal development nonfiction. However, there are some fiction books that will slide in there. Uh, I love to read and I love to talk about it. Uh, it's fun to do so. A lot of very exciting books and productive books out there. Uh, second, I do a podcast uh, month with a guest who is a everyday person. I give voice to everyday people and I talk to everyone uh, on different varieties and walks of life uh, to figure out more about the podcast specifically. Uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, you can see the website link. Click that. Go to Kleitch's Corner. Um, and from there, you can dive into all the podcast guests that we have had on the show. Uh, lastly, I do write a blog, which can be found on my website. Uh, if you want to go to my channel, click on the website link. You can go a uh, further picture of myself, the books that I've read, my podcast guests. And if you go to the journal portion, you can read my blog. Ultimately, I'm looking to build a community uh, of people who value personal development who aren't uh, obsessed with it or you know just go to the nth degree um, they just have a general kind of inclination to want to evolve want to get better want to be uh, healthier and, and more fit physically mentally emotionally and spiritually which is fantastic um, I'm also looking for just open-minded people who like to get together uh, who like to get after it who like to get better um, if you feel like those are some of your values and you want to continue to be entertained by me your boy um, hit that subscribe subscribe button so you get the notification on the new material. I'm not one to blow up someone's email uh, or anything like that. You just get three pieces on a monthly basis and hopefully there is value there. And lastly, you are not alone on the journey. That's why I kind of wanted to make this channel as well. Let's dive in. So we just concluded chapter eight on the book, The Subtle Water of Not Giving a Fuck. It was a great chapter. Um, and we have, and drum roll please, da 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 have reached the final chapter in the book, chapter nine, and then you die. So we're going to end on somewhat of a enlightened but morbid note. Um, I think that the author proposes this specific uh, chapter uh, in a way that says, hey, we are all going to die. Let's talk about it, even though it's slightly uncomfortable. So if y'all are ready to dive in, I'm ready to dive in. So death is the light by which the shadow of all life's meaning is measured, meaning there is a finite amount of time. If we did not have death, we would not have the rich meaning in between. Without death, everything would feel inconsequential, all experience arbitrary, and all metrics and values suddenly at zero. Because there is finite nature of things, we value things more because we know there will be an end. Death is, uh, it's interesting. It's an interesting, interesting thing to talk about. It used to be a lot more common back in the day, just people living and surrounded by death. And, and as deaths happen, uh, lifespans were much shorter. Uh, and so in today's world, people are reaching uh, ages of, of 70, 80, 90, uh, even past 100. Um, we should obviously aim to be as healthy as possible. Uh, but if not, that's okay too. Um, just knowing that it's a part of life, right? It's a part of life. People do die and it's, uh, you know, what creates kind of that emotional uh, love for them when they are alive. So uh, pillar number one, something beyond ourselves. Humans are unique in that we are the only animals that can conceptualize and think about ourselves abstractly. Dogs, cats, monkeys, fish, and any other animal uh, or insect or anything don't move through their daily lives and contemplate where they're at, where they want to be in five years, and the regret decisions making on how they treated people. Uh, really, their only kind of focus is eat, sleep, and survive. And so humans have this beautiful luxury of being able to contemplate all these things, which can overcomplicate or could be the source of generating more happiness. 
We are blessed with the ability to imagine ourselves in hypothetical situations, which is both a positive and a negative, to contemplate both the past and the future while remaining in the present. We can imagine different realities or situations where things might be different. So again, for the good, it can be for creation, it can be for imagination, it can be for uh, visualization. For the bad, it can be fixating on bad thoughts, it could be fixating on uh, worry, anxiety, depression. Um, so it's really just kind of how you use the internal wiring. With that, thus all, or thus we all at some point become aware of the inevitability of our own death. We have two selves. The first is the physical body. The self is only concerned with primal activities, eating, sleeping, having sex, and just kind of those core fundamental things. The second is the conceptual self. The identity, how we see ourselves, how we want to be remembered. And to go to page 120, geez, 192, I swear I'm dyslexic. I haven't been diagnosed, but I swear that I am. We're going to read from the book. All right. This is really good shit. And just to give you kind of further... um, So... We're going to go to Mr. Becker, Ernest Becker. If you don't know that name, he was an academic outcast, uh, got his PhD in anthropology, doctoral research compared uh, Zen Buddhism and psychoanalysis. So some really kind of funky but important stuff. Uh, essentially, his whole life, he kind of went job to job and unfortunately just couldn't quite catch a stride. But uh, what was cool is that at his death in 1994, he wrote a book, and the book was called The Denial of Death. This book would win a Pulitzer Prize and become one of the most influential intellectual works of the 20th century. In that, he makes two points. One, which is what I just addressed, that we're the only animals that can kind of think in that capacity. And second, there are these two selves. Getting back to the second self that we tried, so we try to construct a conceptual self that will live forever because we know of our death. This is why people try so hard to put their names on buildings, on statues, on spines of books. This is why we feel compelled to spend so much time giving ourselves to others, especially our children, in the hopes that our influence, our conceptual self, will last way beyond our physical self, that we will be remembered, revered, idolized long after our physical self ceases to exist. Becker calls such efforts our immortality project. I really, really loved this when I was reading it for the first time because I thought it was just not only really good, but just really uh, the concept of this just made a lot of sense to me. So this immortality project allows our conceptual self to live on way past the point of our physical death. All of human civilization, he says, is basically a result of immortality projects. Cities, governments, structures, authorities in place today were all immortality projects of men and women who came before us, which would make sense. That's what we're trying to do as a, as a society is make uh, strides forward. They are all remnants of conceptual selves that cease to die. Names like Jesus, Muhammad, Napoleon, Shakespeare are just too powerful today or just as powerful today as those men if when they lived. That's the whole point of this. Whether it be through mastering an art form, conquering new land, gaining great riches, or simply having a large and loving family that will live on for generations to come, all the meaning in our life is shaped by this innate desire to never truly die. If you haven't figured it out yet, our immortality, our immortality projects are our values. They are the barometers of meaning and worth in our life. And when, we, when our values fail, so do we psychologically speaking to that point. Um, what Becker says, in essence, is that we're all driven by fear to give, a, give way too many fucks about something because giving a fuck about something is the only thing that distracts us from the reality and in inevitability of our own death. And to truly not give a single fuck is to achieve a quasi-spiritual state of embracing the impermanence of one's own existence. In that state, one is far less likely to get caught up in the various forms of entitlement. Becker then came 
to a startling realization on his own death and on his deathbed that people's immortality projects were actually the problem, not the solution. Rather than attempting to implement, often through lethal force, their conceptual self across the world in terms of war and, and just enslaving cultures, people, um, yes, their conceptual self across the world, people should question their conceptual self and become more comfortable with the reality of their own death. Becker calls this the bitter antidote, and he struggled reconciling it himself as he stared down his own demise. While death is bad, it is inevitable. Therefore, we should not avoid this realization, but rather come to terms with it the best we can. Because once we are comfortable with the fact of our own death, the root terror and the underlying anxiety motivating uh, life's fervious ambitions, we can then choose our values more freely, unrestrained by the illogical quest for immortality. So the last thing I will say to, to that point, well, there's two, there's two points. So if you're someone that does struggle with the thought of death, right, just that, that it's it, right? And, and we're not sure where we go afterwards if you're not of, of spiritual uh, background, um, you know, just to kind of easily knock that pin down, uh, the, the spiritual kind of people out there that know either they're reincarnated or they'll turn into something else or they'll go to heaven. Obviously, that is their their choice. Uh, for those that don't necessarily believe that, um, I want to propose something uh, and an alternative for you that I've been reading very recently that I think is good shit. And, and really what it comes down to is that uh, everything at an atomic level, particles, is interconnected. And so the, the timeline of the world is going to continue to move forward no matter what. We're grateful enough to live in this specific time period in human history. And so as you entered this time period through your birth, you will then exit. And just know that your efforts in your life are a part of the grander whole to move society and the species forward. So you might say, oh, Nick, that's super kind of like bland. And it's like, well, it can be, but it also can be this, this opportunity for you to reach your full potential or give your life meaning to say, when I die, I want to achieve or uncover or learn or master any of these said things. And then that way I can be known as this person who accomplished this fee to help us move forward. So we're all interconnected and that's what kind of rejuvenates the the spurts of us wanting to maximize ourselves and our potential here on earth. <clears throat> Secondarily, the immortality project concept should be also a motivation for you to want to put your name on something in a way that is constructive and not destructive. We're not imposing our values on other groups of people so we can rule them. We're giving them what we have gathered and seen in our life as a present to say, here's what we've seen as success. It is yours to choose from and decipher, but I'm going to give it to you. Kind of like the Bible, kind of like the Quran, kind of like other religious texts is like, hey, when this was created, it was created and it was great, but we're now we're going to give this to you so you have a point of reference moving forward. Okay. Pillar number two, the sunny side of death. The fear of death follows from the fear of life. A man who fully lives is prepared to die at any time. That was a quote, and I really do like that too. A man who, a man or woman who lives fully is prepared to die at any time. Confronting the reality of our own mortality is important because it obliterates all the crappy, fragile, superficial values in life. I think that's so huge because the moment that you've been around death or someone in, in your life has passed away, nothing matters in that specific moment. Nothing at all. The only things that truly matter are how you lived, who you loved, how you treated people, and, and what you're trying to accomplish if you are trying to accomplish something. That is what is the ultimate filter, right? Because once it happens, that's it. So death is the only thing we know is a certainty it must be the compass by which we oriented all of our other values and decisions meaning if you're not sure if you want to do something or not run it by the concept of if i die right now tomorrow will i be regretful of not doing this yes okay then do it that's the filter choosing values that stretch beyond serving yourself that are simple and intermediate or uh, immediate, sorry, not intermediate. Inter, or, in, <laughs> oh man, I wish I could perform this more in the morning so I'd be fresher. Um, but I appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, the simple, immediate, and controllable, and uh, the tolerant of the chaotic world around you. So essentially, it's saying if we can take our values and, and prompt them into more. Uh, 
group serving, serving others type of concepts, it's going to be everlasting versus just serving ourselves. Happiness, therefore, comes from the same thing. Caring about something greater than yourself, believing that you are contributing component to a much larger entity, that your life is but a mere side process to some great intelligible product. So this is kind of what I was mentioning earlier is that there is greatness in community and in group effort in terms of trying to accomplish something very big to move society forward. Our whole goal as a species, and we've kind of got to a point now where people uh, are very comfortable with one another. We don't have to fight to survive so much. Um, I guess I say that in the United States. But uh, anyway, the, the goal should be more group efforts towards the progression of the human species. That's something I think we really need to be focusing on. And so being a part of something like that can give you joy. Um, and, and really that higher level says, even if I had a bad day, bad week, bad month, bad year, I can still take a step back and say, whoa, the, the overall species of human beings has, has come so far. And, and I'm lucky enough to contribute an element within that grander picture. The acceptance of death, this understanding of uh, frugality, makes everything easier, <clears throat> like untangling addictions, identifying and confronting entitlement, accepting responsibility for my own problems, suffering through fears and embracing rejection. It is all manageable when we consider our own death. So what he's saying is that even though you might have problems that you feel are big right now, again, use that filter of I'm going to die someday and how, does it really matter? That is the filter in which to, to use and deal with some of these things. It's worth making the strides. It's worth making the progress. You are all, okay. And then we're kind of end this on a little bit of a happy note. It was a shorter uh, chapter here. You are already great because in the face of endless confusion and certain death, in terms of death being a certainty, you continue to choose what to give a fuck about and what not to. This continual process of developing yourself, your identity, your values, etc., is what success and happiness is. So as the grander whole, we have an objective and that objective is to better the human species or should be just as a very general sense. Within that, though, if you and everyone does their part, could we imagine a world where everyone was invested into making themselves a better version spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically? Um, I think it'd be very heaven-like, quite honestly, even though we are born of the flesh and we'll be, we'll, we will be sinners at the end of the day. Um, all that is to say, that is honestly the, the reason why I made this channel, is I want to build a community of people that even though we know we're going to fail, right? That's the human experience. We're going to fall short. We're going to fail because we're going after really cool shit and we're trying to do awesome things with our life. But just to have a community of people that understand that, that believe in that, that want to be a part of it, that is what the human experience is all about. It's, it's not about me versus you. It's about how can we collectively come together and accomplish really cool things and through that, we'll make great memories of us learning and growing and developing. And it's all very, very beautiful. So be willing to put the work in. This is the completion of the second book of uh, or second book read, uh, the book of the month for November. And that is The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. I really appreciate you guys reading along, listening to any of the videos. I hope they were inspiring. Um, I will be back in the booth for the month of December, I believe, to get my final book out in 2023. But for all the wonderful people that were associated with this book read. God bless you. And until next time, guys, girls, and AI bots.